Hello and welcome to the British Library South Asia seminar series, uh, which is part of our research and digitization project called Two Centuries of Indian Print. We are very happy to have amongst us today Rahi. Rahi uh, Addo is a doctoral student at the Center for Cultural, Literary and Postcolonial Studies at SOAS London. She has an MPhil in Women's Studies from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi and an MA in Women's Studies from Tata Institute of Social Sciences in Mumbai. She researches concepts of childhood, print histories, folk tales, gender, and culture. Her work explores how Bengali children's literature was influenced by attitudes to gender and sexuality, print history, and anti-colonial movements. Rahi will be speaking to us today on the gender journey of the Rupkotha. We are also very delighted to have Shrimoy Das Gupta as the chair for the event. Shrimoy is a doctoral student at the University of Pittsburgh. She has bachelor's and master's degrees in English literature from Jadavpur University, Kolkata. Uh, she re researches on children's literature and childhood studies, and is also interested in women's and gender studies, post-colonial study literature, 19th century British literature, and fan fantasy literature. She has won the Lawler Fellowship for her work on her dissertation, Nationalism, Genre, and Childhood in Colonial Indian Children's Literature. So about the format of our session today, Rahi will speak to us for about 45 minutes, uh, after which there'll be a short discussion uh, between the speaker and the chair, after which I'll open it up for audience questions. Uh, if in the meantime, while the talk or the discussion is going on, you would like to put in your questions, please use the Q&A box or the chat box to do so and I'll take the questions in order during the Q&A session. So without much further ado, I hand it over to Rahi to speak on the gender journey of the Rupkatha. Over to you, Rahi. So thank you very, very much for having me here today. Um, and thank you for the introduction. Um, if it's all right, I'll start sharing my screen right away. Right. Um, so um, the topic of my presentation today, as the title suggests, um, is a Bengali literary genre called the Rupkotha, which um, at least uh, in, the, in the form that it is probably remembered in, in the present day, is one that crystallized over the turn of the 20th century in Bengal. Um, now, th this temporal and, and spatial context is, of course, very important to, to how the Rupatha took shape at this point. Um, this was a time when India was under British colonial rule, but also a time when uh, opposition to various forms of um, colonial oppression had also been gaining ground. Um, and a key event that, that truly bolstered this opposition in, in the Bengal region during this time, for example, was um, the partition of Bengal in 1905. Okay, my slides are not shifting. Um, can someone tell me if my slides changed? Because for me, it's stuck on the first slide. Uh, Rahi, they are stuck on the first slide, I think. It's not moving. Okay. Maybe you could stop sharing and start sharing again. Yeah, to do that. I think it changed now, right? Yes, it did. Right. Um, so, so, so one event that you know bolstered this opposition um, in in the Bengal region during this time was the partition of Bengal in nineteen hundred and five. Um, this uh, administrative move made by the then Viceroy of India, um, the Bengal region, which was at this point, uh, you know, a much, much larger area that would include present day West Bengal, Bangladesh, Bihar, Orissa, Chhattisgarh and Assam, was divided into two halves, so East and West Bengal, uh, 
And this was vehemently opposed by a section of the Bengali community that saw this as fanning communal flames, but also because once the Western part of Bengal was merged with Bihar, Orissa, and Chhattisgarh, it, was it would make the Bengali speaking community uh, a linguistic minority in this region. Um, the movement against the partition and eventually for self-rule took the form of calls for a cultural and political boycott of anything that was British um, and the promotion of the indigenous as a, as a part of a new identity that was to challenge colonial hegemony. And this movement was called Shodeshi from the word Shodesh, which means a country of one's own. Um, and I thought that it was important to give this brief history here so that it is easier to understand how charged the region of Bengal was at this time with questions of uh, linguistic and ethnic unity and with finding this authentic uh, culture that unified all Bengalis. Um, and, and one of the ways in which this translated was through an exercise undertaken mostly by the educated Bengali middle class of collecting material from the countryside, which was seen as somehow untouched by the influence of colonial modernity. Um, and the Rukkotha, um, which was oral tales from the countryside, put to print for the urban Bengali middle class child uh, was one of the most popular genres that developed in the process, uh, having even been called the most Shodeshi of all by Rabindranath Tagore. So the crystallization of the Rupkotha is in that sense inseparable from the context and, and discourse of Shodeshi. Um, however, the association of the Rupkotha to Shodeshi understood in an endogenous way uh, is amply complicated if we look at the history of the genre's crystallization. Um, the beginnings of, of this project, that is of collecting oral tales and giving them a written form or a, or a literary shape can be found in the works of colonial administrators like, um, like G.H. Damont and E.T. Dalton through periodicals like the Indian Antiquary or publications like the Descriptive Ethnology of India. But um, as we can probably tell from the titles, these had a decidedly philological or anthropological motive. Um, and in this kind of a timeline of folklore collection, the Bengali writer and journalist Lal Bihari Dey holds an important position. Um, in, in many ways, his anthology titled um, Folk Tales of Bengal, which was published in 1883, is uh, a prototype of what would crystallize as the Rupatha within a few years after that. Um, and the anthologizer of Thakumar Juli, which is arguably the most popular anthology of Rupkotha, uh, Dokkinaranjan Mitra Mojumdar, himself acknowledges his debt to Day. Now, uh, Day actually cites his familiarity with, um, you know, as the quote says, the Martian of the Brothers Grimm, Norse tales, Icelandic tales, Highland stories, and other fairy tales collected by uh, other writers as the reason why he was well suited to publish an anthology like the folk tales of Bengal. So um, this points to the fact that methods used in the collection of European folk tales were already familiar to at least a section of scholars in the colonies. In Day's own work, um, this is most apparent through the serialized versions of Folk Tales of Bengal in volumes four to seven of the Bengal magazine, uh, which are of course Bengali tales, so Bengali oral tales translated to English by day. Um, and as you can see, narrated um, by the distinctly French mother goose. Uh, and one of the tales, Pokicha, that I've put, uh, put here, uh, even starts with an excerpt from Kubla Khan by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, the romantic poet. Um, 
Additionally, from the mid 1850s, many of Hans Christian Andersen's fairy tales, like The Little Mermaid, The Ugly Duckling, uh, were translated by the Vernacular Literature Society that was trying to mold the taste of um, the reading public and tapping onto entertaining reads, of course, and also shorter fiction as opposed to longer forms like uh, the novel um, in their endeavors. At the same time, the Rupkotha was uh, liberally building on indigenous Bengali narrative or storytelling traditions like the Kitcha or the Gitika. So many of the plots of the Rupkotha, sometimes actually subplot by subplot, were already in circulation within regions of Bengal in the form of oral tales or manuscripts or printed books um, at the time that the literary genre that we know as the Rupkotha is taking shape. So for example, um, the Sheet Boshanto tale, which was in circulation much earlier through Golam Kadar's Sheet O Boshantir Kitcha uh, or Ram Shankar Sharmon's Sheet the Pustok, or say uh, the Rupkotha that we know as Patal Konna Munimala through Munshi Ayazuddin's um, Maloncho Malar Kitcha or through the Gitika or ballads about Molua or Devan Bhavna, right? So, so it's important to, to set out this whole constellation of global as well as local influences that informed the Rupkotha so as to not over-determine um, the Rupkotha by Shodeshi as well as colonial accounts, which, as I will discuss, uh, has direct consequences uh, for the way the genre itself became gendered. So implying a discursive gendering or uh, in the way gender is remembered vis-a-vis -vis the tales of the Rupkotha. So therefore a more nar narratological kind of an effect. Um, and a particular and rather omnipresent figure when it comes to the Rupkotha, who, uh, who for me has been a useful window into the ways in which the discourse around the Rupkotha was gendered is the figure of the old woman. Um, and those of us familiar with the Rupkotha as a genre will also know how, how closely the image of the old woman is, um, is, is linked to our, or our understanding of it. Um, and as this image by um, an artist called Sharada Charon Ukil, um, you know, it meant to depict a bygone era. Um, and, you know, this image shows that there was a particular investment in this figure of uh, the old woman at this time in the cultural sphere, even beyond the Rupkatha as well. So um, the titles of, of many of the collections, yeah, so the titles of many of the collections invoke the figure of the grandmother. Um, so I've put some of the titles up on the slides. Uh, and we find folklorists like Dinesh Chandra Shen defining the Rupkotha as stories that the grandmothers may be heard to tell, uh, heard to tell their grandchildren every evening in remote villages. While this Discussing Horinath Mojumdar's Sanskritized version of Sheet Boshunto, which is called Bijoy Boshunto, which was published in 1859, Shane's primary accusation is that he, quote, altogether conceals the fact that he heard the story originally from the old women of the countryside. On the other hand, Lal Bihari De, while writing his folk tales of Bengal, acknowledges that his endeavor was fueled by Captain R.C. Temples, who, who was a British military and civil officer in colonial India and also a folklorist. So his suggestion that tales told by old women in rural Bengal, who he had found difficult to persuade to share their stories, would be invaluable to the cultural history of the region. So there is a sense that it is inevitably and obviously these benevolent, affectionate and giving old women who best tell these, uh, tell these tales, right? Um, however, it was when I read this following account in the preface to Maeve uh, Stokes's Indian Fairy Tales published in 1879, uh, that I first took a step back and started looking at this association more critically. Um, so I'm not reading the quote out, and um, 
Of course, the kind of project being undertaken by someone like Maeve Stokes, who was a British administrator's daughter, um, and later anthologies of tales collected by Bengali folklorists, you know, they were of course different. And I don't mean to conflate the two kinds of projects, but this account documents the multiple nodes of the oral circulation of the tales collected in this book, many of which actually have tropes and plots um, that reappear in later collections by Bengali uh, folklorists. And that is what is significant. Now, um, on probing further in the accounts of some of the 19th century Bengali folklorists themselves, I found that actually um, their engagement with these old women of the countryside was not quite so smooth. Um, so for example, Dinesh Chandra Shen wrote about his experience of trying to collect uthis uh, from a wash or a manuscript, um, broadly speaking, from a washerwoman's house and being abused by the old woman of the house for his intrusion. Um, <clears throat> this old woman denied knowledge of the putis that, that Sen was looking for. Um, and it was a young girl in the family who later revealed that they were indeed in the house. So despite the fact that this anecdote relates to the collection of puthi per se and not, you know, not to Rupkotha, it does point towards a wariness of old village women towards the increasing flow of urban collectors into their spaces. Um, further, if we look at this um, letter written to Tagore by an unnamed um, collector of rhymes and tales, we see the exasperation of this collector regarding the lack of old women who could provide the required material. So the number of women is very limited and even among them, many do not know any of those rhymes. Um, as a final example, in his biography of Dokkinaranjan Mitra Mojundar, this is what Shankar Shen Gupta writes. Um, and again, I'm not reading the quote, but what is interesting is, you know, the, the mathematical precision of how much this old woman was trusted and the amount of added fiction to make it a quote, fully developed story. So all of these accounts point towards um, a mistrust towards the uh, knowledges, dialects and memories of, of the old women of the countryside, even as anthology after anthology invoked this old woman as uh, the ideal teller of tales. So there is an obvious dissonance here. Uh, and I think that this symbolic portrayal of the old woman is linked to how the Rupatha, as I was discussing earlier, how the genre has commonly been understood in a way that has been overdetermined by both um, romantic nationalist as well as uh, romantic, you know, orientalist approaches. And this romantic understanding of the Rupatha as a genre and also uh, romantic notions of a homogeneous, unified, a Bengali society is connected to the tendency to take for granted the fact that it was always these uh, but but to me the figure um, to ironically be quite elusive um, helps bring together the connected histories of changing class relations, shifting domestic hierarchies, as well as um, changing practices in the region, along of course, with the history of um, cultural nationalism in the region. Um, and I think that the fish as a natural symbol of Bengali culture and tradition, uh, are quite clear in the preface to Thakumar Juli itself. So here uh, Tagore wrote, open quote, my suggestion is that a school be founded with immediate effect for all the modern grandmothers of Bengal and with the help of Dokkina Babu's book, we must restore to them the pride of place that they once held in the dreamland of children. Uh, now in this formulation, which I think gets more and more complex every time I read it, uh, Tagore entwines the conceptions of old and new womanhood 
within uh, the standard discourse of female reform through education, so the school, um, and therefore actually ends up denaturalizing the association of age-old wisdom, especially vis-a-vis -vis the Rupkata with the old woman. So this modern grandmother then needs to be reformed through modern education into tradition. And you know, both modern education and tradition being symbolized by the Rupkatha. And in that sense, the Rupkatha was giving a popular image or a you know, popular birth to the very concept or the idea of tradition or the ancient through the symbolic of the old woman. Um, some of the other indications of the symbolic importance of this old woman um, lie in an understanding of how uh, colonial governance was changing social relations in the Bengal region. Um, so this period saw the setting up of missionary schools, the development of the service sector, um, the creation of many clerical jobs to assist with administrative work, and also the difficulty of setting up large scale entrepreneur entrepreneurial ventures um, under colonial rule. And this meant um, that the ownership of property and land was dwindling with the Bengali community and leading to the consolidation of a Bengali middle class uh, who are often synonymous to as the bhadralok or the respectable or civilized gentry. Um, at the same time, uh, on the domestic front, there was a breaking up of large joint families, as was common for landholding classes, into smaller nuclear families with independent incomes. And there were also a number of reformist organizations at the time that encouraged companionate marriages. So where the relationship between the husband and the wife and consequently their child became the primary site of affective ties rather than being diffused over a larger number of um, extended family members. Um, and importantly, there was a gradual loosening of the control exercised by family elders, and especially that of older women on younger women and children. Um, and in this respect, the opening rhyme to a collection of Rupkatha titled Chorkaburi, so translating to um, the old woman with the spinning wheel, written by the anthologizer um, Noni Kopal Chakraborty, is indicative of the Rupkatha's place within these changing domestic hierarchies. Um, so relevant to my point here is the rationale provided in this rhyme that reads, that is why I have taken the stories out of Chorkaburi's bag and brought them here, uh, which points towards the very strategic role that this myth of the grandmother played in the soaring popularity of the Rupkatha. Um, the old woman in this rhyme signifies many things, right? So she signifies the loss of indigenous crafts and the onslaught of industry. She signifies the loss of storytelling traditions, um, the shrinking of the family. Um, and most important, importantly, she personifies a lost past and a lost inner self um, at a time when Indian traditions and cultures were consistently being critiqued under the Western colonial gaze. Um, the old woman, you know, who in some sense is born again and again with every printed Rupkatha that invokes her, became the personification almost of the rebirth of true Bengali culture for the English educated middle-class Bengali who felt that he or she had moved away from this supposed um, authentic culture. So whether or not the collectors actually collected these tales from old women in rural Bengal, the creation of this myth of the old woman storyteller actually fed into a middle-class dream of a, you know, an idyllic Bengali countryside, and fit into a middle class experience of domestic spaces with this imagined, uh, you know, individualized and dedicated storyteller and an individualized uh, child listener in the face of tremendous shifts in the terrain of uh, the family and the household. And with the loosening power of senior women in the household, it was actually a symbolic reorienting of this mythical old woman's attention on two young children 
that placed the Rupakatha within the larger politics of the time. So the genre was filling in a gap within the Bengali household, which was also a gap that the genre was itself very careful to repeatedly highlight and widen with every publication, thereby also sealing its own necessity and popularity within this new Bengali household. At the same time, the reclaiming of these timeless and feminized symbols and traditions, while on the one hand was of course um, a response to the colonial critique of the supposed lack of a sense of history among the colonized, on the other was simultaneously crucial for, for convincing the Bengali elite that they had indeed progressed. So the old woman en ended up symbolizing everything that the modern Bengali middle-class elites would judge themselves against, uh, which has important implications for how um, the collection of folklore was informed by inequalities of not just gender, but also class, caste, um, religion, and age. Um, so therefore, the, the construction of the other as female, as old and timeless, enhanced the understanding of the modern sovereign ideal self as male, as new, as belonging to the present, and as stable. Right, so, excuse me. Um, so coming now, now to these, um, to, to how these socio-economic and, and cultural changes in the region affected uh, gendered characters and concepts within the tales of the Rupkatha themselves, um, adding now therefore what the element of fantasy and other literary forms had to contribute to this. Um, so I'll, I'll zoom into the tales now and, and bring out how the representations of um, gendered roles and relations and destinies uh, crystallized within the Rupkatha and how these tales uh, relate to the gendered expectations of Shodeshi marked as they were by uh, a conflation of women with expectations of virtue and self-restraint uh, and also with the space of the domestic or the home. And um, if I had to choose a single tale as an entry point into uh, the many gendered um, characters and relations that define the Rupkatha, it would probably be the tale Kiron Mala, um, which is anthologized in Thakumar Chuli. So, um, and, and all of the woodcut uh, illustrations that I'll show henceforth are from Thakumar Chuli itself, etched by the anthologizer himself. So, so in this tale, um, three abandoned babies, um, Orun, Borun, and Kiron Mala, um, born originally to a king and queen, are found by uh, a priest who brings them up. Um, now, many years later, Orun, Borun, and Kiron Mala's biological father, so the king, who is on a tour of his kingdom, stops by the priest's hut, um, feeling very tired and famished. Uh, and we can see him in the background um, in the picture on the slide. Um, and the siblings give him food, water, and shelter. And just as he leaves, it is Kiron Mala, the sister, who asks her brothers, quote, what does it take to be a king? And the rest of the tale is about Kiron Mala going to great lengths to procure whatever is needed to become king including venturing into Maya Pahar, which is this dangerous, uh, you know, misty mountains to find a few secret ingredients that no man has ever managed to get. Um, at the peak of the mission undertaken by Kiron Mala, uh, the narrator tells us, and I quote, but Kiron Mala is not a prince. Hence, she continued steadfastly. In the end, the three siblings are reunited with their father and they live in the palace, which has been built and animated by Kiron Mala. And I see this particular story as both representative of uh, the several gendered characteristics that mark the Rupkatha, uh, but also in many ways as exceptional in its use of um, symbolism and imagery and in its complex troubling of gendered identities and roles. 
Like Kiron Mala, many tales in the Rupkatha genre start with an image of domestic harmony, which often entails depicting characters in uh, set gendered roles. So, for example, the king rules over his kingdom, the queens remain in the inner quarters or otherwise engaged duties. However, this scene of harmony is invariably short lived and it is, almost seems like it's performing a perfunctory role in the narrative because it is soon troubled by the introduction of a crisis. And what this crisis invariably does in all of the tales is turn this initial harmonious picture, uh, you know, with all its gendered orderings right on its head. Um, so in Kiron Mala, uh, the eponymous character is a young woman who aspires to be a king. Um, she prepares for a very obviously dangerous mission as calmly as she waters her plants. Um, and saves a number of helpless and paralyzed men, which also po points to the almost compulsive launching of male characters in the Rupatha into spaces that challenge the efficacy of a martial masculinity, which is something that I will discuss in a bit more detail in some time. Um, so we find, we find similar uh, young women as driving agents of several Rupkatha like Patal Konda Monimala or Shonar Kati Rupar Kati or Bagher Porigats from Rangadidi Rupkatha. Um, so therefore what I'm, what I'm arguing here is that uh, the Rupkatha is a genre whose, whose craft and enchantment essentially lie in the imaginations of gender that go beyond the normative and the expected. Um, the, the frontispiece of Thakumar Juli, which is, which is also the only chromolithograph in the text, um, is an illustration of Kiron Mala at the climax of her quest. So not within domestic boundaries or being the dutiful attendant to her husband, um, or, you know, being in, you know, depicted in an otherwise passive way, um, but, but it is the moment at which she fights all odds to find the golden bird uh, sitting on the diamond tree, which I think is itself a testament to the striking effect of such a representation of the woman on both the anthologizer um, as well as the expected readership. Um, so coming now to, to the representation of masculinity in these tales, which I briefly mentioned, um, and I'll use a different method here. So instead of narrating just a Rupkatha, I will compare relevant parts from different versions of the tale about the brothers Sheet Boshanto as they appear in different narrative forms and anthologies, which I have uh, put up uh, on the slide. So to quickly revise, um, the plot involves a king and his two wives. Um, the first of whom he has two sons with, um, so Sheet and Boshonto, and some in one version Sheet is called Rup. Um, the second wife plots to have the brothers removed from the kingdom. She succeeds, and the brothers are thrown into the wild to fend for themselves. They meet two very different set of challenges, but emerge successful in the end uh, and are reunited with each other. Now, uh, in, in every version of the Shidbosh tale, apart from uh, the Rupkatha version in Thakumar Juli, the fates of the brothers are decided by the act of eating another living being. Most commonly, this is a bird. Um, the brothers usually overhear a bird pair um, prophesying about their fates, saying that the one who eats one bird's heart will become king, and the one who eats the other's heart will. Uh, I think, you know, laugh rubies from his mouth and cry pearls from his eyes. Um, and this is followed by the brothers violently killing and eating these birds. However, it is only in the Thakumar Chuli version um, that this episode is done away with completely. Um, instead, uh, while trying to fetch water for Boshonto in the forest, Sheep is carried away by an elephant that is out to select a groom um, for, the, for the princess of the kingdom. So we, we then have an image of a helpless, helpless sheep being carried um, on the elephant's 
back. Um, and even his seating on the throne is done by other people as he is too shocked to do anything. Um, and we have a parallel image of a thirsty and frail and lost Boshunto who cries himself to sleep in the wilderness of the forest. Um, now, the bird pair episode does appear in a different story in Thakumar Chuli called Neel Komal or Lal Komal, again about two brothers. Um, but here too, instead of the taking away of the birds' lives, the two brothers give their own blood to the bird pair to help them gain eyesight. And this points to another recurring trope within the Rupkatha, wherein male characters are repeatedly sent into unfamiliar spaces that directly challenge the efficacy of a martial masculinity and bring out a softer and more giving masculinity as more desirable. Um, through, through the representations of masculinity in stories like Rangule and Kolabuti Rajkunna, for example, uh, we find the trope of the powerless and small, smaller male characters triumphing over more physically able and violent characters. And even though there are the occasional aggressive uh, primary characters like Neil Komal in the tale Neil Komal or Lal Komal or the minister's son in Patal Kunda Munimala, it is always their kinder, even more vulnerable brothers or friends who the lead princesses choose to marry. Um, the Rupkatha then becomes you know, a domain that imaginatively conjures images of an alternative masculinity that takes many forms, uh, but is almost always positioned in opposition uh, to forms of overpowering, violent, and authoritative masculinities. Um, now, using the same comparative method as in the last section, I will finally highlight uh, a particular way in which the literary mechanisms of the Rupatha um, come together with the changing um, social relations of the time in order to produce very specific effects on gendered representations in the Rupatha. And I will take the same um, sheep bush tale tail um, as the first example. Um, so the opening sequences of the Ketcha version and the version collected by Swinerton um, include a prophesying of the death of the brother's mother or the king's first wife and of, uh, of a subsequent neglect faced by the two brothers. Um, and this is followed by the mother falling ill and the king either himself promising or being made to promise that he would not remarry. And this is a promise that he, of course, does not keep. Um, and soon after the queen dies, um, and the queen's death is a common common event in the 1873, in the 1883 and 1892 versions. Um, in the Ketha version, for example, um, Golam Kadar describes the king being upset for many days after her death and the two brothers crying for their mother as, as their father married a second time. Um, the queen's death, therefore, is an important turning point in all of these narratives discussed. But only in the Rup Katha version of this tale does the queen's fate change? So uh, while she's still replaced by a second wife, she does not die in this version. Instead, she is turned into a parrot by the second wife and is able to fly away to uh, another kingdom. Um, so instead of killing, uh, killing the brother's mother off then, uh, she is given wings in the Rupatha almost as a safekeeping measure enabling her to come back to her family at the end of the plot. Um, and I find a similar treatment of gender destinies in the Rupkatha version of Patal Konna Monimala in Thakumar Juli um, and the Gitika or ballad versions collected by Dinesh Chandra Shen in, in his Monashin Gitika, um, where, where both the ballads uh, Molua and Dewan Bhavna uh, have plots that mirror the plot of um, Patal Konna Monimala. And both the ballads evoke a, you know, a great sense of pathos by, by first setting up the female protagonist as able to overcome a number of hardships and then kind of rendering all of her efforts pointless by the, in, the introduction of 
a sort of a final and insurmountable crisis. For example, uh, in Devan Bhavna, after the female protagonist Shunai has escaped her, and the only way to save him is for Shunai to surrender herself back to the Devan. So the logical end to the goodness of both Molua and Shunai in these in these um, Gitika is in their um, in their taking of their own lives. Um, Molua to save her lover uh, with her, and and Shunai to save herself from being uh, raped by the Divan. Um, in the Rupa, uh, but is reunited with her lover after cleverly tricking her abductor. In fact, in this Rupakatha, the change seems almost deliberate when we study the imagery that is used in the different versions. So, so while Shunai arrives by the river on a boat uh, to release her husband and embrace her own death, and Molua drowns herself in the river, Monimala parts the waters of the river um, in order to escape and return to her lover. Um, so, so while, while Molua and Shunai choose to be consumed by the water, it is the same water that becomes Monimala's escape to freedom. Now, these episodes seem to point towards what I'm calling an emergence of female characters within the Rupakatha. And I use this term not to denote a novel arrival of female characters, as this is definitely not unique to the Rupakatha but a particular representation of these uh, female characters whose goodness is no longer marked by their self-sacrifice, but by their wit and you know, presence of mind and courage. Um, now, this inflection could be related to the emerging ideas of middle-class childhood at this time. Um, as the proliferation of literature specifically directed at the child or the mother raising an, a child, uh, so in the form of books, magazines, child rearing manuals, or even Thakumar Juli being an example, because you know, it's, it was the first publication in a series called uh, Matri Gronthaboli or the mother's book series, uh, showing that this was a time uh, when the emotional and moral ties between the mother and the child were tightening. Um, in relation to this, um, we can think about an essay by Pradeep, Pradeep Kumar Bose, where he describes this new discourse on the family that lay at the basis of the rise of the middle class at this time, with its, um, and I quote, radical separation between work and leisure, public life and private life, childhood and adulthood. Uh, more importantly, he focuses on the centrality of uh, a new idea of the child in the understanding of this family, who was attributed with, uh, and I quote, an impressionability, vulnerability, and innocence, and as requiring a correct, protected, and prolonged period of nurture. Even Tagore's preface, as well as Dokkinaranjan Mitra Mochumda's foreword to Thakumar Juli, therefore contribute to um, the production of what uh, maternal roles for the middle class were expected to be at this time. And storytelling with its attendant uh, implications of leisure, of sentimentality, of affection was really at the crux of this. And um, you know, as, as the closest real world identification of the young women in these narratives, would be the young mothers in charge of reading the tales out to their children, perhaps the repeated deaths of young women, as in the case of the Kitsch or Gitika versions of the tales, were perceived as too emotionally overwhelming for the middle-class child who could afford to be vulnerable, emotional, and intensely attached to uh, the mother. Um, at the same time, the child was also being seen as a figure defined by his or her uh, ability to imagine uh, and in need of not just disciplining, but also entertainment and wonder. Uh, and in his treatise on folk literature called Lok Shahitto, which was published in 1907, um, 
The board comments at length on why folk, folk narratives are best suited uh, to the tastes of children. Um, and in this essay, we can clearly see the child being recognized as an individual with specific literary needs and a specific psychology, which is defined by his or her imagination. So the Rupkatha actually lies at this intersection where on the one hand, dying mothers were considered too emotionally jarring for the child who was now to be in an emotionally intense relationship with the mother, but also on the other, there is the function of fantasy, uh, which is to surprise and in fact subvert what is real or what is conventional, which then animates such imaginative and unreal twists, such as the Durrani turning into a parrot or Monimala parting the waters, which would surely be strange in other genres that are more loyal to depicting events as they happen in the real world. Um, and this has important implications for gendered representations at a time when the boundaries around gendered roles were tightening within the uh, discourse of Shodishi. So, uh, so this brings me to the conclusion of my presentation today. Um, so through my discussion of the old woman who almost defines the packaging of the genre and the discourse around the Rupkatha, as well as the gendered characters and relations within the Rupkatha, uh, what I'm trying to argue is that the context of Shodeshi is of course crucial to the understanding of the Rupkatha. And yet to overdetermine it by the gendered discourse of Shodeshi, which as scholars have argued was increasingly setting tighter boundaries around what was, what was expected from men and women, uh, risks losing sight of the many social, economic, cultural, and, and literary factors that work together to result in, uh, in a much more prismatic understanding of gender. Uh, and I want to state here that in, in doing this project, I don't mean to portray the Rupkatha in terms of whether then you know, this is a progressive genre or a regressive genre but rather locate the Rupkatha very much in the context of the turn of the 20th century Bengal and all the different factors that would inform the crystallization of the Rupkatha, which results in a diversity of gendered representations <clears throat> that help us look beyond the Shurani, Durani binary or the good woman and bad woman binary. So, so rather than be than you know completely becoming an instrument of the Shodeshi discourse and movement, there are ways in which um, a critical reading of both these um, magical tales, um, as well as the paratext of the anthologies, actually resist this and provide ways of imagining gender that go beyond what seems most apparent and most obvious. And, and ultimately the, the most Shodeshi genre of all, therefore also reveals the very fissures and exclusions um, that mark the discourse and the movement of Shodeshi in Bengal. So thank you very much, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Rahi. Um, thank you. Thank you for that uh, in-depth study of the Rupkatha and for bringing in such, you know, um, examples and showing us uh, uh, images, um, which always, I think, makes the Rupkatha more livelier and uh, lets us think about uh, a possible performative aspect of the, of the genre itself. So um, I would now like to invite Shrimoy Das Gupta uh, to have a conversation with Rahi. Shrimoy, it's over to you. Thank you, Priyanka. And thank you, Rahi, so much for uh, inviting me to have this conversation and to chair this session. Um, that was fascinating and it's given me so many things to think about and so many things to talk about. Um, I am having sort of problems sort of figuring out where to start, but I think I'll start where you sort of talk about 
uh, the sort of um, the Orientalist versus the nationalist dichotomy in studying a genre like the Rupakatha, right? And that is something uh, because, I mean, we have had Rupakathas in Bengal um, since before the sort of fairy tale as a genre came into, you know, in into the country as in colonial import. Um, but there have been other genres of children's literature um, which have sort of, which exist as a result of that colonial travel, right? And so even in studying these other genres, I have noticed this same uh, sort of dichotomy. And that's a comment, not a question, uh, but, sort, um, you know, this, and I, I, and I think that that, that dichotomy is, is a very sort of important part in the way children's literature as a category of literature was imagining nationhood. But here's my question. During the Swadeshi movement, you also talk about, you know, uh, not over determining between uh, the local and the global influences. Right. And, and the Swadeshi movement as a moment, which was a coalescing of a sort of authentic culture that united all Bengalis. Um, my sort of question, and I'm very uh, curious about this. So in this sort of tag between the global and the local, there was also an expansion of the local to include the national. Right. So if we think about you know, if we go beyond thinking of the local as regional or sort of like as a linguistic boundary, um, I don't know about Rupkatha and this is coming from, but folk tales have existed sort of across India, right? So I was wondering whether, uh, because at that point there was also like a rep a, a discourse which sort of stated that the partition of Bengal was symbolic of what was going on at a national level, right? And that was part of the uh, the whole sort of uh, thrust against, like that was the direct sort of resistance against the partition of Bengal as a colonial decision, but there was also um, a resistance to um, colonialism based on the concept of the nation, which was going on at the same time and, and through this movement. So I was wondering if there were influences from other vernaculars which made those connections between the local as regional and the local as national, you know, um, and, and also sort of posited this form of influence, just sheer curiosity. Yes, thank you for your question, Shimoidi. Um, and I'm glad you asked this because um, the folk tale or or the fairy tale or you know the rupkatha is is a genre that lends itself very well to these kinds of um, politics, right? Um, and you know, as I tried to discuss towards the beginning, there was this whole constellation of influences that it was taking from. And of course, I guess I ended up um, focusing more on you know, translations of European folk tales and then sort of Bengali narrative traditions. But of course, uh, you know, just like you know, you said about the politics of Shodeshi or and you know the national um, nationalist movement um, transcending these regional boundaries, um, folk, the folk tale did as well. So I think a good example of of this would be. Um, Shita Devi Shanta Devi's uh, Hindustani Upokatha, um, which was actually a translation of folk tales of Hindustan um, by Sri Chandra Bose. Uh, and these were tales collected from the regions of uh, Agra and Aud, right? So again, this kind, this, and also the, these tales were collected from there and then translated to English. And then this was translated to Bengali by Shita Devi and Shanta Devi. Uh, as Hindustani Upokatha. And of course, this, this anthology became quite popular, right? Um, and the, both of these collections were constantly in their prefaces, highlighting how they have received rave reviews in uh, sort of review journals in London. So there's this huge kind of, you know, sort of um, multiple kind of points at which, you know, the influences are drawn or aspirations are stated um, and, you know, the specific case of uh, Hindustani Upokatha and Folk Tales of Hindustan, 
um, being, you know, is, is a good example of how um, the idea of the national was transcending national boundaries, but also transcending regional boundaries, while also uh, sort of creating this discourse of uh, our culture and, you know, Bengali mm -hmm. culture, Pradeshi or things like that. So again, like, like many other tensions that define the genre of the Rupakatha, this is a, uh, definitely a central one. Because Shodesh is is doesn't just mean like our land as in Bengal. Shodesh is also Swadesh. So like yeah. Um, right. Thank you for that. Uh, I and uh, okay. So the next question I have, which you you know you may have anticipated knowing me, which is that there is fairy tales and the fantasy and enchantment that come with fairy tales, and then there is fantasy as a literary genre which was also becoming quite popular uh, around the turn of the century, right? We know, like, we have evidence of people reading Alice, reading Peter Pan, um, there's Konka Boti. Um, the genre of nonsense was becoming uh, popular, which was uh, also uh, uh, embedded in the in the politics of the time, the Shodishi politics of the time. Um, but in sort of, I would say, uh, uh, with in in with different resistive cadences uh, than the than the Rupkatha. and then of course, like Tagore himself uh, adapted or translated uh, Anstey's vice versa, right? The version of which we uh, know today is uh, Freaky Friday, um, and then um, there were. There was a lot going on with the fantasy genre itself. So was did these scholars who were and who were collecting the the folk tales and the fairy tales uh, because of the because of the uses of its enchantments, um, did they sort of was there a distinction between that and the genre of the fantasy? Which also, I mean, I there may not have been, there may have been sort of like a complete sort of um, overlap, but like this is something which um, I am curious about because I haven't been able to find, you know, um, Tagore wrote also the, the preface for um, Konka Bhoti, which came out, uh, the preface which came out in Shadhana. And he again talks about the same uses of enchantment that he's talking about when he's talking about Thakuma Juli. You know, and they are they are different genres um, of the use of the fantastic. So, yeah, right. Um, uh, so, I guess you know about your question about the distinction between the Rupkotha and um, some of the other other texts that you named or other genres that you named, like Pongkabuti. I think one of the main sort of distinctions that was being pushed or you know claimed by the collectors of the folk tales is this distinction between these being collected fairy tales or collected material, therefore authentic, and the others being literary fairy tales or literary fantasy, right? So um, I mean, of course, there wasn't a hierarchy. I mean, I don't. They have you know that's not the way that they've presented. Uh, sort of this distinction, but the claims to authenticity were, were very important to uh, the kind of shape the Rupkatha was being deliberately given at this point. So a lot of the accounts of the collection of, uh, of Rupkatha uh, would, you know, would be accompanied by these excruciating details about how difficult it was to reach these spots and you know how physically arduous it was and you know so therefore corresponding then to how authentic these tales are because they're kind of you know far away from here and untouched by everything that's happening you know here in our region and their region sort of a thing so that would be the main uh, difference between um, between you know something like Konkabuti and um, something like say Thakumar Chuli. Um, and about the so the you know Tagore's uh, preface to Konkabuti, and like I've mentioned to you before, you know it was very it was very important to me when I was studying the discursive 
understanding of the Rupakatha. And Tagore, you know, discusses the, the second half of Ponkabuti, which is a dream narrative, and says, uh, th this is not a dream, this is a Rupakatha. And then goes into, you know, sort of a discursive sort of separation of what constitutes a dream and what constitutes a Rupakatha with very specific comments on, you know, what a child can dream. So Konkabuti is a child and it, this is not something that a child can dream about. And, you know, therefore, you know, as a sort of a Im, Im, implied meaning being that um, the Rupakatha is, is an arena where the imagination, you know, can truly run amok. Right? So it's not a dream, but it's a Rupakatha and all of these things are happening in, these, in this dream narrative. So, you know, it's, it is a Rupakatha. So I think that there were crucial ways in which these other narratives of fantasy were linked to the Rupakatha. And literary, sort of literary, the literary fairy tale was, I think, also heavily building on, on um, you know, the tropes that were already doing their rounds in oral tales that were collected as Rupakatha and, you know, published in anthologies like Thakumar Juli. Konkapote itself, I think, uh, repeatedly kind of takes on, of course, you know, it has similarities with Alice, but it also has similarities with tropes found within, you know, Rup the Rupkatha tradition. And I think it's interesting because at one point, Konkapote, I think when she's trying to figure out, you know, how, oh, she's trying to figure out uh, how she can stop her, you know, stop Ketu, so her, uh, lover and future husband uh, from turning into a tiger and she doesn't know what to do and she actually refers to Rup the Rup you know, Rupkatha tradition and says well in, in Rupkatha you usually when a human being turns into an animal something has been pressed into their heads so I think I, I need to go and look at Ketu's head to see if um, you know, something's stuck there and pluck it out. So he stops turning into a tiger. So I think that, you know, this is a good example of how, you know, literary fantasy was also kind of, ref you know, they were constantly referring to each other in ways that were kind of building on each other. Yeah, no, I agree. And that moment is amazing because like she refers to Rupkatha and she also, I think, listens to her father. Um, right. And then she goes and removes the booty, and that is a fatal mistake. That is a failure. Yes, the plan yes. failed. And so it's like <laughs> her, her, the patriarchy and sort of Rupkatha coming together to give her a prescription um, right. in that right. moment. So it's the comments happen in all kinds of very, yeah. Like I, I know that, and and this sort of brings me to my third question, if I have time for a third question, um, unless, um, you know, the audience have their questions and do I have time um, for a third question? Yes, we do. I think we only have one question as of now from the audience. So please go ahead. Okay, so here's what I was gonna say, right? So the, all the resistance is sort of happening in, in very sort of multi-pronged, multi-faceted ways. And again, I love the thing that you said about alternate masculinity and, and subversions um, of sort of femininity that is happening uh, in, in the Rupkatha. Something that, again, I have also noticed in other genres. Uh, so my question was these, um, specifically about the alternative masculinity. Um, is that, was that present just in sort of Takuma Juli? Because you give us examples from Takuma Juli. And by the way, it was amazing to see those illustrations after such a long time. I don't have a copy of the book here. Um, but yeah, so was that a Takuma Juli specific thing? Like was that Dokhinaranjan Mitra Mojumdar or was that present across other collections of, of Rupkothas as well? Um, right, so I, I refer to a few anthologies of Rupkatha, but, um, and specifically, you know, the ones that declared their sort of, not allegiance, but kind of, you know, place, place themselves within this whole Shodeshi turn and, you know, kind of retrieval of our culture, this kind of a thing. So that would include Thakur Dada Rupkatha, Ranga Didi Rupkatha, uh, Thakumar Juli, of course. Um, right. And I mean, Thakumar Juli, of course, exemplifies, you know, what the Rupkatha was to become. And, you know, in, in the present day, it's common to actually find um, sort of 
pub publications that call themselves Thakumarjuli or even the animated, uh, you know, sort of Sunday primetime series that uh, that's called Thakumarjuli, of course. But the tales that they, you know, adapt or the tales that are printed actually go beyond the, you know, the sort of corpus of tales that were in the original Thakumarjuli. So in that sense, um, so sort of this tapestry is dominated by Thakumar Juli. But I find, uh, you know, to, to answer your question, these alternative sort of imaginations of masculinity, this softer kind of masculinity is, um, is present in other anthologies. But I find that uh, the other anthologies aren't arranged and categorized and streamlined as much as Thakumar Juli is. So if you look at the text itself, it's it's almost kind of excruciatingly categorized, right? It's it has 17 tales and then subdivided into four parts, and then each each part has a theme and you know things like that. So it is more common for other genres to be a bit you know more all over the place with its themes and representations than it was for Takumar Juli but you know in my discussion of alternative masculinities I've definitely used instances from all of these anthologies and I think that it has you know more to do with the imagination of childhood at this time like I discussed rather than an individual anthologizer I mean, I really wish I, I had more of an idea about Dokinaranjun's own motives and, you know, uh, sort of, you know, what was guiding him in his categorizing, but then, I mean, I haven't found anything as of now, so. Yeah, that would be fascinating to know. I think the, also the other thing that adds to this um, alternative, discourse of alternative masculinity is the idea of the effeminate Bengali um, right. and how, yeah. So, mm -hmm. I, I mean, that's the, the, at least that's one of the sort of framing uh, discourses I've found in the adventure narrative. Um, right. For, yeah. Right. So I guess, you know, there's, there's a, enough scholarship on, on this sort of image of the effeminate Bengali Babu or, you know, Bengali uh, Bhadrolo by Mranili Sinha or Indira Chaudhuri. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, you know they, they go into this, topic in great, you know, with a lot of nuance. Um, but I think, you know, as far as I remember, they also talk about, so they place it within a complex politics, right? So there was um, feminization of, uh, you know, the Bengali people by the colonizers as an insult. And then there was also a claiming of this uh, or owning of this effeminacy uh, as, a, as a symbol of uh, the failure of col colonial rule by the colonized, right? So that's that's quite you know the complex politics there itself. Um, and Indira Chaudhary also discusses you know sort of a lot of cultural activities that were happening um, that were trying to also reclaim some form of masculinity, right? Some form you know that broke away from these kind of frail and weak representations of masculinity. Um, and then in that sense, you know, I, I find it interesting that the Rupkotha actually uh, uh, sort of embraces this masculinity, this kind of uh, giving softer masculinity in the way that it is always positioned against these more violent characters who might be villains, but might also be in this sort of uh, Neil Kamal Lal Kamal pair or the king's son and minister's son pair you know, one of whom is, you know, much more violent and doesn't think twice before killing a snake or killing a demon and the other one's scared. But then the funny thing is at the end, it is not this valiant uh, character who kind of paved the way with all these, you know, violent acts and aggressive acts, but the, the, more, the weaker friend that uh, ends up getting married to the princess or the princess chooses to marry this person rather than that so you know that speaks to me about a kind of an embracing of this you know more giving and uh, sort of softer masculinity which is which is interesting about the rupata and you know i have some more kind of you know trying to locate this to do but yeah yeah, I think that is a that is a fascinating thing. I actually did not know that that had happened in the Rupkatha. Um, I had and I had noticed this sort of reclaiming um, politics, as you say, like it's a complex politics and this reclaiming as a form of colonial resistance. Um, but thank you, thank you so much for that 
you know, really enlightening talk and uh, some sort of fantastic and clarificatory answers to my questions. And I'm going to stop and pause for now and, and let give others the chance to interact with you. Thank you. Thank you, Shrimoi. Thank you, Rahi. I think we have two questions, so I'm going to take them in order. The first question is from Stephen Ryden. Uh, do the hijra appear within the stories? Thinking of the historical links to fertility or birth and national tradition, does the lack of their presence say something about the national identity being built? Right. Uh, no, I mean, thank you for that question. And it's a useful, you know, question and an insight. Um, and no, I mean, off the top of my head, I cannot think of a hijra character being being represented here. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the thing that gets closest to, you know, questioning any kind of gendered identities and gendered um, sort of attraction is you know, also in the Kiron Mala tale where she dresses up as, um, as a man and then has this whole attraction episode with nymphs who are trying to seduce her. But no, I mean, nothing about, um, nothing about hijras. And you're right. I mean, the, a lot of these stories were actually uh, narrated um, in the Atur Ghar, so in the sort of birthing room, right? Um, and one, one would assume, therefore, that, uh, you know, given the hijras linked to, uh, may I see the question? Right. So, you know, the hijra, yes, I can see it. Thanks. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so given the hijra's link to, you know, fertility and birth, um, that some of these stories would uh, include, uh, include hijra characters. And, um, and of course, you know, as we know, the, these stories, even though these claims were being made uh, about these, these tales being authentic, uh, and, you know, sort of right straight from the mouth of the tellers who were, more, who were apparently mostly old women, we do know that there was a great amount of sanitizing uh, that happened before they were actually published. So be it, uh, you know, as far as the content was concerned, as far as the language was concerned, and each of these, like you said, has something to say about the national identity and who they would want to uh, exclude from this sort of hegemonic understanding of who the legitimate heirs of the nation were. So yes, thank you. Thank you, Rahi. Your second question is from Isha Shil. Hi, Rahi, thank you for that thought-provoking paper. I was wondering if the other narratives of fantasy you speak of might also open up the space for reconsidering the contact zone spawned by subaltern cosmopolitanism uh, modernities in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Right. So the other narratives of fantasy that, that you have referred to here would be the, uh, so the likes of Konkabote, then the literary fantasy or the other, you know, um, old women's tales that, that I spoke spoke about. I think Isha has to type in her, uh, you know, uh, she has to specify uh, which one. I can sort of speak a little bit while Isha is clarifying. Um, so I think the answer to that is yes, but we also, so children's literature as we recognize it today, the genre, um, apart from the sort of the folk tales, the myths, the rupkathas, which are, which are sort of, you know, which have that kind of pre-colonial past and oral past, that genre is, is very much uh, a, a colonial import. So it does fall into that sort of cosmopolitan contact zone, uh, border thinking middle ground um, with many of the genres like periodicals, like the literary fantasy, like 
you know, adventure narratives um, or even school narratives, um, you know, sort of reacting to the genre as it was imported in combination with whatever was indigenous as well as sort of the laws and rules and policies which were being instituted around these sort of individual, um, you know, like in individual sort of topics, like for example, the school story, or uh, even if we think about, you know, Tagore's uh, formulation of the pedantic schoolmaster, the many poems in which he talks about it, um, a, a tale like Guinea in which he has this young boy who is, um, you know, who is bullied both by the sort of schoolmaster uh, as well as sort of excluded by other children. Many of these things which he saw as endemic of uh, a problem with colonial education, right? Um, and, and so let's say something like Pagla Dashu is obviously sort of responding to that. Something like Hemendra Kumar Ray's adventure stories is sort of responding to this idea of, you know, uh, Bengali children having their imaginations opened um, to various kinds of others, right? Others within the nation, others within the region, and then others in the exotic abroad. So many of these are actually sort of um, functioning within that contact zone that you mentioned, but. Also, I think the question to think about, and this is something which I haven't found the answers to yet, the question to think about is, you know, what, what then is the function of that cosmopolitanism, right? And what then, how far does the significance of that contact zone go? It's being deployed in various ways. But then there is also the indigenous, which is being posited very, very strongly by various elements in India. So, yeah, so that's like my take on the whole thing. I think, uh, uh, thanks, Shrimoi, for elaborating. Uh, I think uh, Asha has already specified that she was referring to Konkavoti. So, Rahi, would you like to respond to her? Yes, no, I think, I mean, Shimoidi really I mean, summed it up perfectly. And also because I think narratives like Konka Bhuti, which, uh, you know, deal with the larger question of fantasy narratives, especially the literary fantasy is much more Shimoidi's field than it is mine. So um, I'm happy to, you know, just let it be at that answer. Okay, I think we have one more question. Um, no, no. Uh, I think Asha was trying to clarify that she had a, uh, she made a typo. Uh, Subalt, uh, yeah, she was speaking about subaltern cosmopolitan modernity. So there is no question, but we could we could wait for questions or uh, Shrimoi, if you want to ask something else, uh, you do not have much time. We will have to wrap up soon. But if there's anything uh, that you feel that you want to ask Rahi. Um, Please go ahead. Well, I, I, you know, Rahi's talk was so wonderful that I have so many questions and so many points of discussion that if there is space, there's something else I would sort of like to ask, which is that you also talk about this sort of, I, I don't know whether to call it a dichotomy, but this difference between sort of a child who needs regulation and discipline um, versus the child who needs sort of entertainment and worlds of imagination opened up to them, right? And this is a discourse which is taking place simultaneously in, in Britain at the same time, you know, which is why I also talk of this as, a, as both uh, an import as well as sort of actual indigenous concern. Um, so in the middle of this is education, which one would think, um, you know, is solely on the side of regulation and discipline, but is often not because in positing alternative indigenous discourses of education, pedagogy methods, imagination was emphasized um, and very much sort of like a romanticized idea of education. So 
within which sort of like these these tales, uh, the fantasy, the enchantment, uh, the tales with also their like the uh, Rupkotha with also its connection to nature, um, which you know formed a big part of thinking about romantic pedagogy again both across the uh, across both countries right so i was wondering again within this sort of body of scholars and writers and thinkers who are dealing with the genre um, apart from that one thing which you mentioned about tagore talking about a school for modern grandmothers is there anything else that you've come across where you know um where the rupkotha features into these educational discourses as well um Right. I mean, all, the, there's two kind of examples coming, you know, coming to be, they're not directly related to education vis-a-vis -vis curriculum, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but just a kind of a differential kind of valuing of English and, you know, English writers, Bangla Rupkatha in, I think, Indira Devi's uh, memoir, where, uh, you know, she, she talks about, you know, how she her her mother would never read uh, read out or you know narrate rupkatha to her and that even her servant wasn't that great but her cousin usha didi's servant you know i think mongola was you know a very good storyteller so how she would always kind of cuddle up with her cousin and listen to you know this you know her attendant tell them stories and then how she would go back to school where she was apparently a popular cool kid and, uh, you know, when she was kind of waiting for the school bus to come, being surrounded by uh, her fans, um, she would narrate English fairy tales to them, right? So again, this doesn't relate to curriculum, but in my head, it's more related to the space of the school, the kind of school that Indira Devi being from, you know, the Tagore family would have gone to, and then the home space of, you know, the Rupkotha, and, you know, sort of knowing what was cool and what was, you know, home, homely and comfort, right? This is one. And then this whole tussle between the child who needs regulation versus the child who needs entertainment. Again, this is not related to curriculum, but one of the sort of, one of the sources that uh, really kind of brings this out for me is child during manuals, right? So, um, the, uh, so there's one called Shantanet Choritra Gothon, I think published around 1920s, um, which actually talks about, um, the, which actually has a whole chapter dedicated to golpo or stories, right? And this entire chapter is a, a discussion about the fact that because the child, you know, is imaginative and imagination is, of, you know, is also the call of the hour, the child needs to read and, you know, understand uh, Rupkotha. But then it is, it is followed up by this discussion about, but, you know, these tales talk about little boys and girls falling in love and go into, you know, all of these descriptions about how beautiful the girl is. And this is not right. And, and so, for, you know, for me, this is an anxiety about imagination taken to its logical extreme, which is <laughs> sexual imagination, right? And, you know, there's this, huge amount of anxiety in this chapter about so then you know how do we kind of tighter this to you know give them the the right amount of imagination while also not going you know too far so so this kind of push and pull about you know how much imagination and who imagines and how does one imagine uh, also became the flip side to the question of, you know, how much regulation, you know, how much uh, freedom of imagination and expression. So, uh, so yeah, so, no, I mean, to answer your question, I can't think of anything, any Rupkata in the curriculum, but maybe that's something that I will need to probe a bit more into. Thank you. Well, first of all, I will say educational discourse doesn't always have to do with curriculum. And, and these you know, conversations between children in playgrounds and bus stops are, are as important um, to the whole sort of concept of how we consider the education of a time. Um, right. But I would also say that the idea of, of, you know, that you pointed out of the Rupkotha lending itself to sexual imagination, sort of that being taken to an extreme. This is also happening right at the same time when debates about child marriages and child sexuality are completely like raging 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, and of course, there was always the concept that like, like, you know, a part of girlhood mm-hmm. was the leaving of the family at a very young age and going to an in-laws family where they are for all intents and purposes brought up in a way as well. So I find this fascinating that there is resistance to Rupkatha in these grounds when the tradition is just so alive uh, in, in, in society and domesticity of that time. Right, um, absolutely. Thank mm. you, uh, Shrimoi, and thank you, Rahi. It is time to uh, wrap up. It's nearly seven and we don't have any more questions, but thank you for that you know, very enriching session, for that very lively discussion. Um, thank you to our audience for joining us tonight and uh, please join us again on the 19th of July, same time at 5.30. Uh, we have Professor Ananya Jahanara Kabir from King's College London and Ari Gautier, who's an author based in Oslo. And they will be talking to us on Vine on Trellis, Pondicherry's Creolizing Culture. So do join us and uh, have a great evening and thank you for joining us again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me.